2 Corinthians chapter 12. I've been preaching, this is the fifth Sunday now, on the subject of finding victory in unanswered prayer. And it's been a very interesting journey along the way. Next Sunday is going to be the last Sunday on this series. But all of us have experienced disappointment when we prayed and things didn't work out the way that we had hoped and the way that we had prayed. It was a very special privilege to pray for Ellie uh, during her pregnancy and a very dangerous time and a very dangerous pregnancy and to lift her up and, and uh, people from the church brought meals over to help out and to make sure she wasn't getting out of bed and Matt was such a big help at home and the children were so supportive and God heard and God answered and we praise God for that. But all of us have experienced times when we've prayed and when we have asked but the answer, if the answer came, and sometimes we have experienced no answer, at least what we felt like was no answer, and other times when the answer came and it was not what we were hoping for, it's not what we were asking for, and in many ways we wondered, where is God in times like this? I've often thought that, and I've, I've practiced this, so have you, um, when, when there's a real need in my life or a real need in your life, Maybe we want to go to special people and ask them to pray. And maybe we know somebody that's a real warrior, a prayer warrior. And they spend a lot of time in prayer and God has heard them and God has answered them. And God has done good things through them. And so I'll go to them and I'll recruit them for prayer. And I was thinking if I lived back 2,000 years ago in the time of the early church, I, I would just go to the Apostle Paul. What a great man of God the Apostle Paul was. Read the book of Acts and see the wonderful things, the power of God manifested through his life and through his ministry. When I read the book of Acts, I see that the Apostle Paul um, prayed for a lame man one day who received strength in his legs and was able to walk again. I see the Apostle Paul prayed on another occasion for a woman who was demon-possessed, and that woman was delivered of those demons. I see the Apostle Paul who prayed for a dead person who received life, came back to life after having died. I see the Apostle Paul even doing things sometimes the other way. Prayed for a man that he might be stricken with blindness. And he was stricken with blindness. There are verses in the book of Acts that are just kind of general verses. That tell us that Paul healed many in a particular city like Iconium or other places. So Paul was a great man of faith. He was a great man of prayer. He was a great man of miracles. He was a man who seemed to have God's ear. Isn't that right? And so I would think if I had a real need and I was living in Paul's day, I could go to the Apostle Paul. Except 2 Corinthians contains an interesting and well-known unanswered prayer in Scripture. Paul, according to his text, was caught up to the third heaven. Now, if you've wondered sometimes, and we will read our scripture reading in a moment, but if you've wondered sometimes, who is Paul talking about? Because some translations um, are, are, re, re, translate this, I knew a man. And, and um, others make it look like it was Paul himself. And the Greek, the Greek is two words, Ido anthropos. Ido means behold. Anthropos. A man. And so Paul is simply saying, Behold, a man. And he's in reference to himself, that he himself was caught up to the third heaven. And there he received, and by the way, what's the third heaven, you wonder? Well, the scripture refers to the, the atmosphere around the earth as the first heaven, space is the second heaven, and the dwelling place of God as the third heaven. And Paul is telling us that he was caught up into the very presence of God. And there Paul received special revelations that were wonderful and great, and in some cases too wonderful and too great to share. He wasn't even allowed to reveal some of the things that he learned. What a fantastic event, folks! What a fantastic experience! Paul was special. 
He was privileged. He was blessed by God. He met the resurrected Lord. He was caught up into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What a great privilege. But Paul writes that to keep him from becoming conceited and having an exaggerated opinion of himself, God gave him a thorn in the flesh. No problem. Paul's a man of prayer. Paul's a man who has God's ear. Paul's a man who has seen the mighty moving of the Spirit of God upon the lives of the people for whom he prayed. And so Paul prayed. And Paul pleaded. And Paul asked for the thorn in the flesh to be taken away. But God's answer to Paul was, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So that leads me to a couple of questions. Number one, what was the thorn in the flesh? The Greek word for thorn is scallops. Not like scallops that we eat, okay, but scallops. And it means a sharp stake. It's actually in reference to a long pointed stake piece of wood that you would drive into the ground. And Paul is saying that he had a stake driven, as it were, into his body, into his soul. He's talking about much pain. Maybe not physically, but spiritual pain, emotional pain. It was a tremendous event. What was the thor source of the thorn? Well, Paul actually, in the text that we're about to read, tells us that it had two sources. Number one, it was God. It was directed from God. There was given to me a thorn in my flesh from Satan, who was the deliverer of it, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So sometimes people wonder, is my trial, is my illness, is my need, is my circumstance, is God doing this to me or is Satan doing this to me? And the answer might just be yes. Directed by God, delivered by the devil but under the control of God. Remember, we talked about that last week. Now, would you stand together with me as we read our scripture reading this morning? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. And it says, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things that man was not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak then I am strong. Heavenly Father, as we come now into the Holy Word of God and we consider the Apostle Paul in his prayer that his thorn in the flesh might be removed and your answer to him. Lord, I pray that we would find victory in our prayer lives and realize that while you don't always answer the way we want and you don't always take things away like we would like them taken away or give them as we would like them given, that you are a God 
who provides all that we need for victory, for satisfaction, for peace. You're a God of grace, a God of sufficiency. Bless our time now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So I want to see three parts of this passage of Scripture. First of all is the request. Paul writes that his request three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take this thorn in the flesh away from me. Nobody knows exactly what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Some people think it was a physical ailment. Some people think it was a problem with his vision because of hints that he gives us in, um, in writing his epistles that he was not the one who wrote them down. He dictated them um, and, and had a secretary who wrote them down for us. And you read like, for instance, in the book of Galatians at the very end, he says, see with what large letters I write to you. He is writing the final greeting and he's writing it very large and some people think that he, uh, that was in the day before reader glasses and he had to write big and so that he could see it. Other people think it was a person um, th that was sent to torment him. Nobody knows. We don't know what it was and it's even better that we know, don't know three times. The Apostle Paul pleaded with the Lord to take this away from him. I want you to understand that his prayer was very specific. Remove this thorn for your glory is what he was praying. Lord, if you'll do this, I'll give you the glory. I'll testify of your greatness. I'll tell everyone of your wonderful love. I'll tell them of your mighty power. I will write it out to the churches in the letters that they might know that you're a God. You are a God who hears our prayer and answers our prayer. He asked very specifically, I've heard preachers, especially health and wealth preachers, saying, be specific in what you're asking God for, as if if I'm not specific, God doesn't know my need, okay? God knows my heart. He knows my need. He knows my struggle. I don't exactly have to lay it out in absolute detail. I don't need the medical terms in order for me to explain to God what's wrong and what he needs to do. No, but Paul is being specific. He is being specific, and he's pleading with God that God would remove this thorn the flesh. His prayer was, was um, persistent. Persistent. Um, there's a bumper sticker out there. It was while I see it on, on a car that says pray hard. I don't know what pray hard means. I, I'm going to be honest with you. Pray hard. Pray. 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 <laughs> pray hard. Does that mean pray a lot? Does it mean pray more? Does it mean pray persistently? Does it mean pray consistently? I don't know what hard means when it comes to prayer. But I know that I pray. And Paul prayed. And he prayed three times with God. Uh, Perikaleo is the Greek word from which paraclete, if you remember, is the word that the New Testament uses for the Holy Spirit. One who comes alongside of us. And Paul says that he called out to God, Perikaleo, to call to one side, to beg for help. God, God, come and help me with this. I have a thorn in my flesh. It hurts. It troubles me. It's agonizing. I'm struggling with this. Come to my side, God. It appears that the first two times the apostle prayed that God was silent. The third time, God gave a very specific answer. Now, before I get into the specifics of the answer, the bottom line is God said, no, Paul. He said, no, I'm not going to take this away from you. That's the short version of our text. You have a thorn in the flesh. Paul prayed. God was silent. And then God said, I'm going to have you keep the thorn. I'm going to have you keep the thorn in the flesh, Paul. I've heard your prayer. But I'm not going to take this away from you. But you see, that's not the end of the story that is before us. And that's the, never the end of the story when we pray. And when we pray and we feel that we are victim of unanswered prayer, maybe we need to listen more closely to exactly what it is that the Lord is saying to us. Because I want you to understand something. God never leaves you stranded. No matter who you are, no matter what your struggle no matter what your thorn, no matter what your dilemma, no matter what your conflict, no matter what your hurt, your sorrow, 
the agony of your soul. God, if you are God's child, God will never leave you stranded. I want all the rest of you to just sit tight for a moment. Josh and Kendra, I should have thrown this into my sermon yesterday. In all of your life, God will never leave you stranded. Never forget that. Always remember, God is on your side. I knew there was a part that I'd forgotten in the sermon, okay? <laughs> God will never leave you stranded. Sometimes we feel stranded, but we're not. Sometimes we feel alone, but we're not. We are God's children. We are God's people. We are God's beloved. Did you see mom and dad up here with their babies and their children in their arms? Could you see the love? Could you feel the love? I heard somebody on, on TV this morning say, you never really know how to love another person. You never realize how much you could love another person until you've had your own baby. Guess what? You're God's baby. You're God's child. He adores you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. And he will not leave you stranded. He'll never leave you hopeless. He'll never leave you helpless. He will never leave you without everything you need to endure the trial and find the victory that God longs for you to have. Remember that no trial comes to us outside of the knowledge of God. God is all-knowing. These things don't happen, happenstance. God isn't sitting in heaven and saying, wow, I, I didn't see that one coming. No, God knows. God directs. Satan may deliver. God directs. And God leaves, gives to us everything we need to endure the trials that he directs into our lives that we might find victory in the midst of it. And that leads us to number two, the reply in our text. Verse nine, verse nine, the Apostle Paul's reply, or God's reply to the Apostle Paul. And God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. See, the Apostle Paul was saying, Lord, I have this thorn in the flesh. It hurts me. It hinders me. It harms me. It interferes with my ministry, Lord. Take this away. Remove this from me. And God said, no, I got something better. I have something better. See, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's filled with heartbreak. We live in a world that's filled with trial and trouble. We live in a world that's filled with all kinds of medical problems because man sinned in the Garden of Eden and mankind fell and we became a broken people. And the longer life continues on this earth, the more broken we become, the more frail we get. And God is saying to you and to me, my grace is sufficient. Now next week, we're going to talk about the fact that, praise the Lord, sometimes God does specifically answer our prayer and remove things miraculously. And other times he does not. That's for next week, okay? But today, God speaks to the Apostle Paul and says, My grace is enough for you. My grace is sufficient. Paul, I've got something even better for you. I've got something even, even greater, even beyond what you ever expected, beyond what you imagined. I have grace. I have grace. I have grace for you in this thorn. And maybe Paul thought to himself, because I think Paul was human just like I am human and just like you are human. And I think I would have said, I think I'd have interrupted my prayer and said, whoa, whoa, Lord, whoa. I think you misunderstood. I know there's a lot of people talking to you all at the same time, God. And I think you misheard. I was specific. 
I was persistent. I prayed hard. <laughs> Whatever that means, God, I did it. This isn't the answer I want. I want this stake removed from my soul. I want healing power, and then I'm going to tell everybody of your glory and your wonder and your love and your compassion. I'll use it for your glory, God. And God said, no. I'm going to have you keep the thorn. But I'm going to give you grace. I don't want the grace, and I don't want the thorn. And God says, and that's why I'm leaving you with the thorn. That you learn the wonder of my grace. Folks, grace is heavenly strength for the need of the moment. God gives you grace for the need of the moment. It's supernatural. Grace is a miracle. We tend to think that we define the miracle, and if God really answers, he's going to do the miracle our way. And God was saying to Paul, Paul, I have a bigger miracle. I have a bigger miracle for you. It's not the miracle of removing the thorn. It's the miracle of implanting grace in you to endure it all. Grace is the river, folks, that flows from the throne of God to my soul, to your soul, that brings peace and calm. And acceptance and hope and gladness in the midst of the thorn in the midst of the trial you see God gave two great promises to Paul I'm going to give you grace and I'm going to give you strength I'm going to give you grace divine enabling and I'm going to give you the strength to endure. I don't know if you remember way back when I started this series. I talked about it takes greater faith to live with a burden than to be healed of it. Sometimes I would just like to have these burdens removed from me but to live in the midst of it and trust God and accept gratefully from God that which comes from his loving hand. That's what I need divine grace for and that's what I need divine strength for. And there are two important words in verse 9. Number one is the word sufficient. I just sat and meditated on that word, sufficient. Sufficient. My grace is sufficient Archeo, the Greek word, all that you need, enough. Paul said, Lord, remove this thorn. And God said, Paul, I'm doing something better. I'm giving you all that you need. I'm giving you enough. Folks, think about that. God has given you all that you need. God has given you enough. Enough for victory. Enough for peace. Enough for a quiet soul. Enough for calm. Enough for trust in the Lord. He's given you enough. He's given you sufficient all that you need. Grace comes to us in the midst of our need, folks. Grace is tailor-made. Years ago, I went to Hong Kong. I was on a mission trip. And while I was in Hong Kong, I heard all about these wonderful suits that you could get made really cheaply. And I had a friend that lived over there, and he connected me with a very good tailor who made an incredible suit for me wonderful quality and it costs like thirty dollars a jacket pants a vest it was incredible one problem with it I'm just going to tell you if you ever go to Hong Kong there was one problem with it and it is that the material shrunk over the years <laughs> eventually it got so small I couldn't wear it anymore you gotta watch out for that Hong Kong wool you know 
But other than that, it was wonderful. It was tailor-made. I have never worn a suit that fit like that. What a delight it was. Had my name embroidered inside of it and all. Somewhere, somebody bought it at a Salvation Army store and doesn't know who Russell Schwartz is, but thought, oh, this is a good suit. Tailor-made! Guess what? Grace is tailor-made for me. God tailor makes the grace for me. He tailor makes the grace for my situation, for my circumstances at this time in my life. Just like trials are tailor made, God tailor makes the thorn that we receive, the trial that comes our way, the suffering, the persecution. The sickness, the hardship, the dilemma, the pothole in the road, the hurdle is tailor-made by God. And then God gives us the grace, sufficient grace, to see us through it. I have a very dear friend that has a severely disabled child, severely handicapped. The child today is about 45 years old has never developed beyond the mental state of maybe a two-year-old, can't sit up, can't feed herself, can't care for herself in any way. And I watched her grow up through the years. And I watched them. I watched them with their child, with their baby, and then with their toddler and then with their child, now with their adult. I have never seen a harder situation in all of my life. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't have the grace to deal with that. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have the grace to deal with that. But I'm going to tell you why. Because God didn't put me in the situation. But if God put me in the situation... God would give me the grace to deal with it. Amen. Some years ago, my wife was killed in a car accident. I can't tell you how many men have come to me and said, I don't know how you handled that. I just couldn't have done what you did. I marvel at the fact people tell me, you didn't become angry with God. Guess what? If you haven't been through it, you don't have the grace to deal with it. You know why? Because God didn't put you in it yet. Now, I don't mean yet. Hopefully, you'll never be in it. But when God puts you in it, he gives you the grace to deal with it, folks. That's what my grace is sufficient means. It's enough. It's all you need. It's all you need to be victorious, to have peace and calmness of your soul. But but grace is tailor-made. God doesn't give you the grace to deal with a severely handicapped child unless he gives you the severely handicapped child. And God doesn't give you the grace to deal with the death of a spouse unless you experience the death of a spouse. And lots of you have hurts and you have pains and agonies in your soul and agonies maybe beyond description and beyond my ability to even understand what you're enduring today. And I marvel, I marvel that God has given you enough He's given you grace. He's given you all that you need to be victorious, to trust, to walk in faith, to walk with Jesus, to rely upon him. Verse 9b, Paul says, Therefore I'll, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Paul's response is very simple. I receive your grace, Lord. I receive your power. I accept your answer. Because it is an answer to prayer. God said you can keep the thorn, but I'm going to give you the grace. And Paul said, I accept victory from you. Now the name and claim it, people, just rebuke the devil. How come Paul didn't do that? This is the great Apostle Paul, folks. This is the great Apostle Paul. Read the book of Acts. He cast demons out of people by the power of Jesus. Well, if this was a messenger of Satan sent to torment him, 
Why didn't he just rebuke the devil? Because he realized this was a thorn from God and that God wasn't going to remove it. And the thorn was being used for his good and for his growth and for his victory. Sometimes we pray and we ask. And God says, no, but my grace is sufficient. And our mindset needs to change. And we need to receive that which God is giving to us for the victory in the tailor-made experience of life that has come our way. These are times when God says, I want you to live with this infirmity. I want you to live with this thorn. I want you to live with this trial. My strength in you is being perfected in you through this. Have you heard the saying, that which can't be cured must be endured? Well, that's not a Bible verse. And I don't think the Apostle Paul would agree with it. Because he was way, way beyond that. Paul was saying, I'm going to boast. I'm going to boast in my infirmity. Because I can see the grace and the power of God at work in my life. Can you see the grace and the power of God at work in your life, folks? In your trial? In your hardship? Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a job difficulty, a financial matter. Maybe it's a family hurt. Can you see the grace and the power of God at work in you, in you, in you. Because God is at work in you. You see, I think Paul was saying, I was asking for a morsel of grain. God gave me a harvest. I was asking for a trinket. God gave me true wealth. I was asking for the physical. God gave me all the abundance of heaven. Oh, sometimes we sell God far short, far short, because God's doing so much more. His grace is sufficient enough, all that we need. And so let me leave you with three great principles. Number one, burdens come with blessings. Understand every burden in your life comes with a blessing from God. There's a reason when the thorn doesn't go away. And God is bringing blessing to you. He's bringing blessing to you in it, through it, because of it. He wants you to boast in him. To boast in his greatness. To boast in his sufficiency. To boast in his power. To boast in his love for you. Grace and strength are God's gift to you. Principle number two, burdens are specifically chosen for us like a tailor-made Hong Kong suit. God's interested in you as an individual. And your thorn isn't going to match somebody else's thorn. And your burden isn't going to match theirs. And your trial isn't going to match theirs. And your hurt and your suffering and your sorrow isn't going to match somebody else's. Because God's tailor-made it for you. But in it, his grace is sufficient for you. And then sufficient grace comes with sufficient faith. Faith to believe, faith to endure. I have a friend. Maybe some of you have heard the name before. Um, her name is Dory Van Stone. Anybody ever read the book, Dory the Girl Nobody Loved? Nobody, huh? Dory Van Stone, her and her husband Lloyd were missionaries to Erie and Jaya. They were among the very first missionaries. What was known back many years ago as the Stone Age people, they were discovered. Um, no contact with, with outside people ever. They were still living in the Stone Age. They were missionaries to those people and they came back to the United States. Um, they were in their 40s, early 40s. Lloyd was a great guy, very physically fit. Uh, Dory, just a ball of fire. Excited about the Lord. And Dory was working in her flower garden in her front yard one day. By the way, the book, she was raised as a foster child and unloved as a child. It was amazing. Her story is an amazing story. 
But on this particular day, she was working in the flower garden in her front yard, planting flowers, pulling weeds. Lloyd decided he was going to go out for a jog. And he was gone a few minutes. 15, 20 minutes maybe. And all of a sudden, Dory became aware of an ambulance screaming down the street in front of her house. She looked up. And then she stood up. And she stood there with muddy knees and a shovel in her hand. And her mouth dropped open. And she thought, Lloyd. Lloyd. Early 40s. Lloyd died instantly of a massive heart attack. Dory was hurt. She cried. She agonized. And she became angry. She told me, I made a fist at God. I said, God, what are you doing? Why did you do this? Dory attended at the time a very large church. And she knew people in the church that were struggling in their marriages and struggling in their relationships and couples that were together and not madly in love like she and Lloyd were madly in love. And she said, Lloyd and I, God, Lloyd and I loved each other. Why did you do this to me? And when people would ask her, she would say, God's grace isn't sufficient. Oh, she went to church. According to her, parked her Buick in the parking lot, walked in, sang the songs, listened to the sermon, and went home convinced God's grace is not enough. And one day Dory, by the way, Dory's still alive, lives out on the East Coast. One day Dory was driving by the church and she pulled into the parking lot during the week. She got out of her car went into the church and prayed. And she knelt before God. And she stayed there. She stayed there. Stayed on her knees. According to her, she dumped, this is her word, cartfuls of anger out before the Lord. Her anger at God, her hatred for what he had done, her disillusionment with God's care and God's protection and God's provision and all the frustration that had built up in her, she poured it out before God and she dumped it there on the altar of the church. And then Dory Van Stone stood up and she walked out of that building a free woman. She got involved in ministry. For years, she would travel all over the United States, around the world, as a matter of fact, teaching and preaching at women's seminars and women's groups. I had her in my church in Alaska several times. And this was her message. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. What we need is God, folks disillusioned with God not answering your prayer like you want it to be answered. God's grace is sufficient. God doesn't mind if you pour out cartfuls of anger and frustration with him. If that's how you feel, God wants to hear. And then God wants to heal your heart and give you sufficient grace, enough to give you victory in your circumstances. God is an amazing God. God is a God of grace. May the grace of God be sufficient for us in our times of hurt, our times of need, our times of sorrow, our times of suffering, our times of pain, our times of agony.